I must go down to the sea again, the lonely sea and the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. Those wonderful words come from John Macefield's poem, Sea Fever. And we really hope during this time of pandemic that we can give you the bug. Because we've got a fantastic exhibition for you, organised by our curator of contemporary maritime, Laura Boone. And it showcases the lives of six wonderful photographers as they live and work in a maritime environment. Our exhibition is called Exposure Lives at Sea and it's a very important time to showcase the maritime world because whilst we've all been locked down we've perhaps forgotten that wherever you are you can look around the room that you're in and all you'll see is things that are somehow connected with the sea voyage. 90% of the world's trade is carried by sea. Many of things that we eat, the things that we wear, have come or have their origin or connection with the sea. And all through this time, seafarers have been at sea and sea workers have been at sea, not all of them able to contact their families. But it's a fantastic life and it's a wonderful environment. And this exhibition will showcase it for you. And remember, sea workers are key workers, but they're also fantastic characters with the most extreme and wonderful lives. I'd love you to come and have a look at this exhibition. Why don't we go and have a sneak preview together? Come on. In 1995, I got my first commercial fishing job in Alaska and ended up uh, you know, going away for a couple months every summer for years after that. And I felt like at that time, social media really wasn't happening. And there wasn't a lot of images from the current life at sea, um, you know, the commercial fishing world that was happening at the time. Um, you'd go into uh, fish restaurants and see all these nostalgic old uh, black and white photos of commercial fishermen with these huge catches. But it didn't seem like there was a way to find out what exactly was going on on commercial fishing boats today. Um, so my curiosity about commercial fishing, my love of the work, also uh, made me want to make a photographic project out of my life as a fisherman. Um, Hi, my name is Octavio Burto and I am a conservation photographer. I am from Mexico, but I have been living in the United States for the last 20 years. I started as a wildlife photographer and then specialized in underwater photography. In the last 10 years, I have been using photography for conservation projects. In 2001-2013, I'd been predominantly working commercially as a freelance photographer. And I think I felt that I just wasn't able to sort of negotiate my, my time that in order to allow me to concentrate more on these projects. So, I think I'd kind of hit, uh, I'd reached the point in 2013 where I just felt right now is the time when I have to really change things and I actually remember seeing, a, there was a feature on the news on television about the offshore oil and gas industry and I thought now here's an industry, our, our, our last remaining heavy industry. Um, that is still operational, there's an opportunity here for me to do a project in an environment that hadn't really been covered extensively photographically before. The motivation behind my work is to bring science to a larger group of people and bring it to people in a way that's impactful and that connects people with scientists. A lot of times we think of science as being separate from communication, but communication is actually an integral part of science and photos are a really impactful and powerful way to communicate science. So the motivation behind my work is to communicate science through images and help them come alive outside the pages of a peer-reviewed journal. Um, Antarctica and, and, and polar regions is, uh, in general are, are a place that, um, again, interested me um, for as long as I remember. Um, I have been trying once I, you know, started working. I have been trying to uh, apply to various different polar programs in different countries. Um, 
and uh, every few years I'd come back to uh, to the idea and the um, British Antarctic Survey is one of the more renowned places and organizations that do um, polar exploration and science in uh, in Antarctica. With this project I, I tried to give people at home a um, glimpse into a world they knew little or nothing about because I don't think uh, many people know that um, basically 90% of, of all the, the things that we use every day are uh, brought from one end of the world to another by people like us, by seamen, by sea. After all, we are a planet, we live on a planet covered by, by oceans. We're inspired to create exposure, lives at sea, due to our desire to increase awareness of the important role that the maritime industry and seafarers play in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, however, when we started researching it, we were amazed at the huge um, array and quality of the photographs that were captured. It was really important to us that every photographer is employed within the maritime sector um, in order that they can give a more intimate portrayal of what their life is like. Just like the maritime sector itself, the exhibition explores a huge range of topics from what the ocean means to us, the environment, um, isolation and the impact that COVID is having. I invite you to join us here at the Maritime Museum once we reopen to enjoy the exhibition for yourself. Um, but for now, I will hand over to my colleagues, Helena, Abby, Celine and Rob. Thank you. So my role is quite logistical. I work with the design and curatorial team to um, through the design process. Um, coordinating all the different works, bringing on specialist services when needed. For example, for this exhibition, um, 3D design and 2D design was in-house, um, but we brought on um, lighting design from outside of the museum. Um, I keep, keep a close eye on the programme, making sure everything happens at the right time, which is really important. That's a big part of my role. Um, and work through the design stages um, with the whole team and whole museum, bringing in all the different stakeholders um, at different points throughout the process. And then um, bringing it to completion, there's an on-site um, phase, an Im implementation phase, um, where we um, build the exhibition and um, install it. Um, and there have been certain aspects that have been quite tricky during um, lockdown and working remotely. So, for example, the design um, stages, we've not been able to have the same sort of on-site design reviews that we would normally have with um, lots of different people involved, sort of actually on the ground looking at materials and samples and prototyping things. Um, so we've had to do a lot um, via uh, Teams and Zoom. Um, and then as well, in terms of implementation, only being able to have a certain amount of people in the gallery at any one time. So um, it's, it's been a challenge for sure. So as an exhibition designer, my main role is to create a space for the narrative, for the story we are bringing to the gallery. Um, there's quite a few different steps um, to come to the end product. I'm going to take you quickly through um, the main work that I've, I've, I was involved in for exposure. The first thing is to really um, understand the story and then for this instance to understand what each photographer's work is and how they work and what um, we want to give to the visitor um, throughout their journey. So the first thing is to uh, model the space, the gallery, creating walls for each of the photographers, creating an interesting journey so that um, we can really showcase each of the works um, to their best. The next thing is to look at links, especially for this exhibition, because there are six different artists to, to find those links between each of them and then use that as a sort of first um, palette for colors, for textures, for materials. Um, the main thing that came up to my mind for this exhibition was water because um, they're all um, showcasing their work um, 
on, on water, on the oceans, on the sea. And how could we bring that into contextualization, into the space? So um, something came up to my mind, which was rust. Obviously, rust gets um, a lot of it on cargoes, on ships, and um, um, the erosion of the water was a nice poetic link to each of the artists. So we created section panels um, for each of the artists in a rusted metal. Um, and that was then a good link for visitors as they walk into the space to kind of um, go from one um, artist to another. The next thing is um, obviously looking at colours, choosing colours. Again, we often look at um, clues in the artist's work and how they um, um, protrude the colours within their own work. Um, and then also a very key element is to collaborate with other people um, on the project. Um, so the, the, the graphic design is a very, um, very important element, especially in this exhibition. So working with Abby on this project. And another very important collaboration is um, working with um, AV and digital um, experts um, to bring another element to the exhibition, which is um, films and um, videos. And um, so, yeah, that's in a nutshell what, um, what I do as an exhibition designer. Um, the final stage is to um, have everything built on site. And that's, um, although we designed this exhibition all throughout lockdown, which was um, um, quite a challenge, um, but a, a new way of working. The biggest challenge really was to um, work on site with contractors and obviously with all restrictions that was um, uh, much more difficult but again it's a new way of working and being much um, uh, making sure we're very um, concise in how we communicate things and um, using um, what we have the tools we have nowadays um, through photographs videos um, really to get um, <clears throat> making sure we get the final product so as the 2d designer my key focus was on all the graphical elements so that includes the title treatment typography um, use of materials for graphics as well. That's a huge collaboration with me in the 3D, along with um, the extra graphics we produce. So we've got a map in there. We also looked at different ways of producing print. Um, so my involvement was kind of heavily linked with 3D. So we come as almost a pair to this project. So working through how to visualize Celine's original concept in a more graphical way, as well as making it accessible and legible and tie in with the key themes of each photographer. So this project was an entirely new experience of exhibition design, purely because we started this project during lockdown one. So we've had very minimal time together as a team, especially for concept development. That's a, normally a very collaborative experience and something you all will meet and discuss. Whereas obviously with lockdown in place, it was a lot of learning how to communicate ideas visually and through email and video call rather than it just being a natural flowing conversation, um, which was a very interesting experience. I think it really helped bond us as a team because we had to learn not only what describe how we wanted to do things, but also be able to visualize that in a way that everybody with all different backgrounds would understand and especially when it came to concept sign off and develop design presenting that through video call rather than it being a conversation where you can physically show samples of things you can have things made and get people to physically touch materials we couldn't do that at all um, so it's a very different way of designing uh, with some really interesting points that I think are going to be involved a lot more in exhibition design moving forward, having to take into account sort of the distance that people will be at when looking at things and how they'll move through the space differently because of COVID-19 and all of these different elements that normally aren't taken into account and working on how to make them look great as well as be practical and functional and obviously on brief. So it's been real team building. Uh, I am the um, art and object handler team leader for um, the Royal Museums Greenwich. So um, it was my team that was involved in the uh, installation of all of the works. So uh, it was up to me to make sure we'd got the right tools we needed um, 
to make sure that there was the schedule in place um, before we even started and, and to make sure that the schedule was uh, easy enough for us all to follow and um, realistic enough for us to complete uh, the install on time. Uh, and then when it came to the install, uh, I would uh, debrief the team so we knew what we all needed to do, uh, which works were being hung and when, and um, yeah, just um, making sure that the design teams um, designs came to life in 3D. Uh, lockdown obviously had um, an impact on us. We, we went from uh, having a two week period of install um, to having to try and complete within uh, four days. Um, so obviously a, a drastically shorter install period. Um, and obviously being the team leader, it was uh, kind of my responsibility to make sure that not only did we complete the work in the set time that everything was still done to uh, a high standard and um, that, that we didn't um, jeopardise any of uh, kind of health and safety or, or our um, high standards in doing so. Um, but I'm very pleased to say that we managed it. Yeah, assistant. Assistant is a little monkey. Um, he was given to me by uh, by my girlfriend. Well, actually, to be honest, I, I should have said that he was uh, he was loaned to me uh, by my girlfriend um, when I was going to Antarctica. And the idea was that um, assistant has travelled um, to a lot of places in the world, but he's never been to uh, to Antarctica before. Um, so I think it was a little bit to for him to uh, keep an eye on me. <laughs> And uh, and also to to you know for me to bring him out. In terms of what the C means to me, I mean I think this year has been interesting because this is the first year in about seven years when I haven't been out at sea, and I I, I really miss it. Um, so it's something that really gets into your system. I think uh, I'm sort of addicted to the smells and the senses and the unpredictability, sometimes danger that uh, the ocean presents. And I think for me, it's, it's just a beautiful place. It really makes my life whole. For me, the ocean means life and it means a place where I am happy and a place where I'm the most creative. The ocean means freedom. The ocean means, I don't know, life. We are, we came from the water. I feel like when I'm in the water, I'm almost a different person. You kind of are counteracting the effects of gravity. You're weightless. You're disconnected from the rest of the world, but maybe more connected to your creative process. The ocean was like this great escape into this mysterious, um, unknown world where, you know, you drop a hook down with a little piece of bait on it and you never know what's going to come back up. And it's really exciting. The idea of something, some great thing or mysterious creature being down there. I think other than the, uh, maybe the uh, the depth of the uh, of the oceans or the bottom of the oceans i think uh, the polar regions are probably uh, the least touched um, regions of the world um, and there is still i think a lot to explore no matter the dangers we always chose to to confront them and to sail into the unknown, whatever, because we didn't have maps, we didn't have compasses, we didn't know where where we would end up, but we were, but we just kept kept on going forward, chasing the horizon. The ocean is everything. It's life itself. It's home.
My favorite image in the exhibition is the diver with the big school of fish. I took this image in a very tiny area called Cabo Pumo in Mexico. Now it's a national park and it is considered a no-take marine reserve. That means that in the last 25 years, there, this area hasn't had any fishing activities. I was always a marine and ocean person and then I moved to Florida about 10 years ago to work as a biologist for the U.S. Geological Survey and I started swimming in Florida's freshwater springs and it was absolutely the most clear water I'd ever seen in my life. And I first started using photography to document these ecosystems and show how amazing they were and show this kind of hidden part of Florida that very few people know about. Bristol Bay, Alaska is home to the world's largest wild sockeye salmon fishery. Uh, for over a hundred years, fishermen have been harvesting a portion of the nearly 50 million fish that come back to spawn every year. Um, it's one of the most sustainable systems in the world and it's totally pristine and untouched by development. Um, but we are under threat by a project called the Pebble Mine. Um, it could become the largest open pit mine in the world. But when there was a collapse in 2016, you heard the word decommissioning being used a lot more frequently. And I'd always sort of approached the, this project with a view to being almost like a, a time capsule for future generations when we had kind of moved beyond um, extracting oil and, and gas from the North Sea and looking at more renewable energies. I think, um, again, I'm, I'm not a scientist, and uh, but I, I think there is a consensus that obviously the, you know, I believe the global warming is happening. I, th I believe the global warming is uh, at least accelerated, uh, if not caused by the um, human activity. Um, and I think uh, it puts, Antarctica as we know it in danger. The marine life has recovered amazingly. And these fish, the big eye travalis, are gathering in thousands of fish with the purpose of mating and reproduction. Healthy oceans should look like this. Then over time, I actually ended up documenting the decline of these freshwater springs as we started to pump more water and pollute the water and as Florida continues to grow, we continue to impact these springs. And I used my images to help communicate these changes in a way that was more impactful than using just words or facts or numbers alone. So um, I, I just heard uh, that the colony isn't as big as it used to be. I think there, is some, there were a few years with uh, a loss of sea ice, which is something that uh, the penguins absolutely uh, need. The place they'd be digging is just upstream from where I fish, um, north of the Quijack River. Um, and it's sort of one of my life goals is to use my photography to tell the story of Bristol Bay, bring awareness to this remote, uh, pristine region and uh, try to get this mine defeated before it ever gets permitted. I think it was said to me, a friend had sort of mentioned to me recently when I, when I showed him um, a couple of shots of the Ninian Northern platform, which is currently being dismantled up in Shetland, he, he had sort of said to me, there's a real, there's a sort of sense of sadness that these platforms are being sort of abandoned and dismantled, but, uh, but, um, but at the same time, a sense of hope because we're finally moving away from fossil fuels and that's significant. Yeah, it's not easy working in an um, isolated environment like on board a vessel. Um, and if you're not built for it, then you cannot do it. You just give up. I know a lot of people who gave up. For most of my adult life, I've spent about two to three months on average uh, commercial fishing in Alaska. And uh, it's a pretty isolating experience. Um, we don't always have access to internet or phone service and being away from family and friends uh, can be 
can be hard. I actually really love working in isolated and remote environments because there's such a tendency now to always be connected, always be on email, always have your phone available. And I find it so much easier to really go into this mode of deep thinking and creativity when I'm in these places that seem to be disconnected from kind of everywhere else. We also um, have availability of uh, uh, phones, so you can actually make a call every few days, every every couple of weeks to um, uh, your loved ones. Um, so from that point of view, you're probably now much more in touch with uh, with what's going on outside than, than you would have been even 10 or 20 years ago. I find it incredibly inspirational to step away from the computer, not have access to email, put on auto replies, um, not be connected for a while, read a book, uh, relax, form stronger bonds and relationships with uh, your good friends and fellow fishermen out there. Um, there's an incredible community within um, the fishing world, especially in Alaska. Um, and we're such a tight knit group. I think it kind of makes up for the the uh, missing of family and, and friends when you're away. Many years ago when I started this job and we didn't have as many possibilities for entertainment like we do now, we were just spending time together, playing cards, watching movies, this sort of reading, these uh, sort of things. Now, now we have access to the internet, we have smartphones, we have tablets, we have laptops, and we tend to spend more and more time isolated from each other, even though we are together on board the vessel. It can be hard to have friends who maybe don't understand why you're always gone or why you don't have cell service. And one thing that's been actually really amazing on the flip side of that, though, is that, you know, you might end up having a harder time with some relationships, but you end up building really strong relationships with other people who do exactly what you do. Now, um, it's a little bit different, I suppose, maybe with, uh, with my girlfriend. Uh, we met before I went south. She gave me assistant, um, so you know, assistant was uh, was there with me, and I think it was um, it was much harder for her uh, to kind of stay behind than it was for me to to be in Antarctica because I was where I wanted to be, um, and uh, but but that 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 bit was was harder. That bit was more difficult, I suppose. Oh, so you do you miss certain certain characters, the, the camaraderie. And again, as I've said before, everything seems so much more amplified when you're offshore. So those little routines, conversations that you have with sort of key people that you connect with become so, so important um, and prevent all, and, and that sort of contributes towards you feeling less isolated. The uh, lockdown at the moment is any bit as restrictive as it was, you know, as the environment forced you to be um, in Antarctica. But I, I definitely feel like the, the experience of having been there um, helped a lot. When the pandemic kind of continued for longer than we thought it would, I actually bought a camper van and headed out to the American West to work on a story about swimming in remote alpine lakes. In, um, in this part of the country. So in Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and Idaho. And it has really been this incredible opportunity to explore a part of the country that I otherwise uh, would never have the chance to see because you end up needing to do other international projects. Um, I'd had quite a few supply vessel trips sort of lined up. Um, and I, I had, I, and I'd, I mean, even in the summer, I had sort of tentatively sort of approached the one of the operators just to just to ask what the situation was but they you know clearly had to be extra vigilant because they had sort of crews changing crews that were maybe coming from different countries um, there had been a number of um, outbreaks on the drilling rigs and platforms as well so um, there just wasn't going to be any opportunity to to, to go out there we were very lucky. Uh, there was very minimal 
cases that showed up in Bristol Bay and uh, we were able to continue with our season as usual. For those of us who were on board the vessel already when the lockdown started, um, it was a bit different because I don't think we realized in the beginning how exactly how serious this is. And we only started to, to realize to realize it um, when it was our turn to go home. And we discovered that it's not that easy. You know, in Ireland at the moment, uh, we are in level five um, restrictions and they gave us five kilometers away from the from the primary residence for exercise. That's plenty. <laughs> as far as photography, I just had a brand new baby and uh, I was actually pretty excited to have the time off to spend more time with my child. So my favorite shot is the one I took during cargo operation this year after the lockdown started. It was kind of a surreal atmosphere. It was night. It was uh, the the terminal was empty, no people around. It was dead silence, and it looked somehow sad. And I, I couldn't help but wonder if this would be the future of uh, of our industry, of the shipping industry. I like that shot because, in my opinion, at least, describes the condition of the seamen all over the world especially during during the pandemic uh, we felt alone we felt lonely and uh, many of us felt abandoned well i'm sure you'll agree with me that was absolutely wonderful i want to say a few words of thanks uh, first of all to an individual donor who's given anonymously Thank you very much. It means so much to us. I'd also like to thank Lloyd's Register Foundation, who sponsor the post of Laura Boone, our curator of contemporary maritime at the museum. And of course, to all of our sponsors and supporters, thank you very much. Special thanks, of course, must go to our six wonderful photographers. What a fantastic job they've done and what fantastic lives they've revealed to us through their wonderful photography. And of course, a great thanks and a deep and heartfelt thanks to all sea workers, both at home and afloat. I think we'll all agree that this was absolutely beautiful. It's thought provoking, but it's also pretty witty. Thank you all very much. In hindsight now, when I reflect on my time on the, the rig, uh, there's so many experiences that I, I miss. Extremely long hours and uh, dealing with horrible weather and uh, sometimes difficult other people. Um, it just makes life that much more special back home where I can share all the stories, um, that fascinate people that have never experienced this life. This image for me really captures why I do what I do. And I just absolutely love being in these remote, hard to access places in the ocean, capturing science that wouldn't otherwise be documented. I think, um, you know, once you have an idea what you want to do in life um, and, and, you know, just, just keep doing whatever you can. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, do it every day, every minute of your life, but keep going back to it and keep, you know, cracking at it. Um, and hopefully it'll happen. And if it doesn't happen, maybe other things will happen on the way. And, and often um, photography it can be more about the journey than, than the outcome. There's one more thing I wanted to say is that never in a million years I would have imagined that uh, um, my project, my photos at sea would end up in, uh, in an exhibition like this one. What I am expecting of sharing my work at this exhibition. I hope that people, after seeing my Im images at the National Maritime Museum, they will care more about the health of the oceans and they will join us to fight climate change and other big challenges that humanity is facing. Maybe for people who um, 
come into the museum and have a look at the pictures and you know think about uh, all the stuff that you know they'd imagine I I did or whatever. I think it's important to kind of believe that you can do it. I'm like I'm not special. I would have never imagined something like this. I mean, to end up uh, in a museum, in a, in a project as, as big as this. So I wanted to thank you for, uh, for your confidence and for your appreciation. And I'm sorry I cannot be there <laughs> to see it, but who knows. Maybe things will change and next year I can visit it. Do you think you'll go back to Antarctica one day? Um, my girlfriend <laughs> might kill me. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to. <laughs>